Hello, my name is Katie Sieri, and I'm a graduate student in the Fisheries and Conservation Biology Lab at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Today I'll be talking about length frequency distributions and habitat associations of coastal California fishes across a latitudinal gradient. And I'll be presenting uh, on behalf of my co-authors, Rick Starr, Mary Gleason, Ryan Fields, Jackie Mohey, and Kinsey Matthews. So we'll start you guys out with a little bit of background. The West Coast ground fishery is of high commercial value and consists of over 90 species. Of these ground fishes, many inhabit high relief rocky bottoms and were shown to be overfished in 2000. Rock fishes in particular are vulnerable to overfishing because they're long lived, slow growing, and late to mature. In fact, many stocks have only recently been declared recovered. There is very little fisheries independent data on these rock fishes and other species that inhabit high relief rocky bottoms, since traditional trawl methods get hung up on high relief rugose rock. Therefore, there is a need for a fisheries independent tool to survey these habitats. I'd just like to lay out some of our goals. So overall, we wanted to develop tools and techniques to better survey high relief untrawlable habitats. And therefore, with these tools, improve stock assessments by providing better information about density and size structure of fishes in these high relief habitats. Video surveys have become increasingly popular. They allow for surveys at greater depths than traditional UVC methods. These surveys encompass a variety of techniques, including manned and unmanned submersibles, as well as baited and unbaited video landers. Video landers in particular are lightweight and cost-effective solutions for surveying fishes over a variety of habitats. Our lab has developed two video lander tools for surveying fishes in deeper water. These systems are equipped with stereo video technology, which allows us to measure fish length with a high degree of accuracy. On the left is our rotating lander system, equipped with a stereo video camera pair on a rotating arm. On the right, you can see our newer benthic observation survey system, or BOSS, which is equipped with four stereo video camera pairs, giving us a near 360 degree view. Both of these systems are rapidly deployable and allow us to collect information on densities, lengths, and habitat association of fishes, especially over high relief rocky bottoms. So today I'll be discussing um, some trends and data collected using our rotating lander system and BOSS system along the California coast from Santa Barbara to just north of Half Moon Bay. So on the left, you'll see a map of rotating lander survey locations that were surveyed from 2013 to 2015. And on the right, uh, you'll see a map of the BOSS survey locations uh, surveyed in 2018. So using these data, we wanted to answer several research questions. First, are there yearly variations in fish lengths? Second, are there differences in habitat associations among species? Third, are there latitudinal trends in fish length? And finally, what are the relationships between fish lengths and depth? In order to compare length frequency distributions among habitats, years, areas of the coast, and depths, I selected four species, lingcod, boccaccio, vermilion rockfish, and canary rockfish. These are commercially important species that have different life histories and are commonly seen in our video surveys of the California coast. So to start out, we wanted to evaluate trends in length among our different sampling years. So what you see here are yearly distributions of fish lengths. So year represented by color, um, and these are kernel density plots with density on the y-axis and length in centimeters on the x-axis. So overall, we can see that there are some year classes moving through the population. For lingcod, you'll see that 2015 and 2018 have a larger uh, mean uh, a larger size, and this is likely due to a uh, year class getting larger and moving through the population. This same trend is apparent for Boccaccio. Uh, in 2015 and 2018, we're seeing uh, larger fishes, likely due to this uh, strong influence of a year class moving through. For vermilion rockfish, uh, you can notice the purple bar representing 2018. Uh, which shows that there may be an influence of a smaller year class uh, in that year. For canary rockfish, uh, we see evidence of a larger year class moving through in 2018. So just to continue to evaluate uh, annual trends in lengths, 
We're now looking at a graph of mean length for each species, which color, each color representing a year. So differences in length were evaluated using an ANOVA test uh, for year and a Tukey post hoc test. So you'll see that the mean length of Boccaccio was greater in 2015 and 2013. Um, and once again, this is likely due to the influence of a large year class maturing uh, through the years. So we see that uh, the mean length of canary rockfish was greater in 2018 than all other years. Um, and this could be a large year class um, appearing in the population, or it could be due to some other uh, confounding effects. So in 2015 and 2018, Lingcod had a greater mean length than in 2013 and 2015. So we're very likely seeing a large year class maturing over time uh, and therefore resulting in these uh, longer mean lengths uh, in 2015 and 2018. For vermilion rockfish, there are some trends, um, but these could be due to spatial variation in our sampling sites or uh, you know, other factors. There's no really strong trends by year here. So we also wanted to evaluate uh, trends in lengths by habitat type. So here you see a distribution of bottom types surveyed, um, which was determined visually for each video sample. Um, so this is a proportion of all their, our drops uh, over each substrate type. So you'll see that the majority of our drops, uh, a little bit more than 50%, are over hard bottom, um, but the other three bottom types are also represented in our surveys. So in order to evaluate um, the effect of habitat types on length, um, we're going to visualize a graph of mean length of species by habitat type. So these data uh, were evaluated using an ANOVA test on habitat um, and also Tukey's post hoc tests. So you can see for Boccaccio rockfish uh, that they were larger on hard and mixed hard substrate than on softer bottoms. It is likely that larger individuals prefer these hard substrates. For canary rockfish, we see no real difference in mean length by bottom type. This is likely because canary are a highly mobile species. Additionally, we often see canaries on the ecotone boundary between sand and rock. So these results may be an artifact of how we measure bottom type. For instance, we could be calling a site sand when it's actually sand adjacent to rock and we're just unable to see the rock. Um, so if you look at our trends for lingcod, you'll see that lingcod have similar mean lengths on hard and mixed hard substrates, but mean lengths are different for all other habitat types. And overall, you see that mean length increases as you move from soft bottom to hard bottom. So we know that lingcod settle out as small juveniles on sandy bottoms to avoid predation and then show strong ontogenic movements towards harder bottoms as they age. For vermilion rockfish, we can see that they are larger on hard and mixed hard bottoms than on soft and mixed soft bottoms. So overall, the trends here we're seeing uh, are causing us to reconsider whether we should just be pooling our hard and mixed hard categories and our soft and mixed soft categories into just hard and soft categories. So we're continuing to evaluate um, the preferences of these species on habitat types. Um, so here we're going to be looking at maturity status by habitat type. So what you're seeing are the proportion of mature and immature individuals over each bottom type for each species. So if we call our attention to lingcod, we can see that the greatest proportion of mature to immature individuals is over hard bottom, which suggests that adults prefer hard bottom. And this fits with the trends we've been seeing previously and what we know about lingcod habitat preference throughout their lifespan. This trend is also true for Boccaccio. A greater proportion of mature individuals, uh, as opposed to immature individuals, is found over hard bottoms. For vermilion rockfish, uh, we're seeing mostly mature individuals with our lander surveys, but you can see that the ratio of mature to ind immature individuals is greatest over mixed hard and hard bottom types. For canary rockfish, we're seeing relatively few mature individuals. There is some indication that we see a higher proportion of mature individuals over hard bottom, but there's likely uh, influence of the si uh, sampling bias that I was discussing earlier, or perhaps canaries just really have no age-specific habitat preference. 
So in addition to annual differences in length and differences of length by habitat type, we wanted to evaluate uh, spatial differences in length. So we conducted a cluster analysis to determine spatial groupings and community composition. So what you see here is a map of some of our sampling sites in central to southern California. These sites are arranged from north to south, and these colors represent uh, these clusters of similar community compositions. So these uh, community compositions uh, were determined using a Bray Curtis cluster analysis. So you can see uh, in the dendrogram here, uh, sites that are similar in community composition are, are represented by the same color. So now that we've identified that there are differences in community compositions among these sites, we wanted to then evaluate length differences among those clusters along the coast. So I'll be showing you four box plots, one for each of the species. Just to orient you here, we're looking at median length um, with our central to southern California sites listed from north to south on the left and colors representing the site groupings that we saw in the earlier slides. So for Lincod, there appears to be an increase in mean length or median length as we move from north to south. Particularly, we're seeing larger lengths uh, from Point Sur and south than we are in central California. So this could indicate that there are longer Lincod in southern as opposed to central California. And this is consistent with the findings of Laurel Lamb's master's thesis. So moving on, uh, let's look at Boccaccio rockfish. So we do see uh, that these site groupings do appear to correspond to these median lengths. And we also see the same trend for increasing length as you move from north to south. In particular, these central California sites are of a lower median length than the southern California sites. So the kind of similar trend that we were seeing for Lincot appears to be true for Boccaccio. So if we look at vermilion rockfish, we see a slight trend uh, for increasing median length from north to south, um, but there are likely some other factors affecting lengths here beyond just these site groupings. So for canary rockfish, um, once again, this trend for uh, increase in median length from north to south is still um, possibly evident, um, but to a lesser extent. Um, so we recognize that, you know, these trends that we're seeing could be influenced by the depth of our sites um, or other confounding variables in our sampling techniques. Um, so overall, these are just uh, interesting trends that we're beginning to evaluate uh, based on latitude, uh, certainly warrant further investigation. Finally, we wanted to evaluate the relationship between depth and length for these species. Surveying these species across their lifespan requires a wide variety of tools. When we put together data from nearshore fishing, submersible surveys, diver surveys, NIMS trawl surveys, and video landers, we're able to get a more comprehensive look at how these species are moving with depth throughout their lifespan. What you're seeing here is a GLM output for length as a function of depth for each of these different species based on measurements taken from these different tool types. For Lincot on the top left, you can see that large individuals aggregate in shallow depths, then smaller individuals in mid-depth and larger individuals as we move deeper. Lincod spawn near shore and then young settle in mid-depths and move to deeper waters as they age. For Boccaccio rockfish, we see a sharp increase in length with increasing depth up to about 100 meters and then a more gradual increase. We know that young settle and shelter in kelp forests and then move to deeper waters once they're large enough to avoid predation. For vermilion rockfish, we're seeing a much more complicated uh, relationship. We see large individuals in shallow depths and then length drops off briefly with depth and begins to steadily increase. There's something very interesting going on here with vermilion and we're not sure what it is. We're not sure why we catch such large vermilion in shallow waters. So this is definitely a trend we're going to continue to investigate. For canary rockfish, there seems to be a pretty steady linear relationship of length and depth. Uh, individuals move from shallow to deep as they grow. So just to wrap up here, we saw that year classes strongly influence length trends and that depth is a strong determinant of length frequencies. So that some species show ontogenetic movements onto hard bottoms, habitats. We saw evidence for spatial differences in lengths. Um, and, and overall, an understanding of these length differences is important for assessing the spatial variability in stock characteristics. 
So I uh, just wanted to call your attention to some of my uh, colleagues' talks uh, at this conference. And I just wanted to acknowledge everyone that helped collect these data uh, and analyze them as well, as well as some of our funding sources. In particular, I just wanted to give out a shout out to Coast and thank them very much for providing me funding to attend this conference. So that's all I have for today. And thank you guys so much for listening today and have a great rest of your conference.